Good afternoon. It's good to be back. And uh, I've got something in my heart wanted to share, but we need help. We need God because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this afternoon. Thank you that we can get together like this. We pray and ask, Lord, for your presence to be with us, for your wisdom to flow, that the message come from your heart to the heart of the people. Teach us, Lord, to see beyond the natural and teach us how to apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. I've got a message. I, I titled it, Struggled, Struggled with God. It's a story about Jacob. It's a journey where he became, from Jacob, he became Israel. And um, it's a very long story. It started in Genesis 25, ended in Genesis 33. But I'm going to give you a background summary. I summarized in eight points. Uh, number one, it started with Rebecca having heard God. Uh, Isaac married Rebecca when he was 40 years old, but it was 20 years before Rebecca could get pregnant. And during pregnancy, there was the tempest in her stomach. He didn't know what it was. Then he asked God. Then God told him he's going to be a twin. Then Isaac um, loved Esau, but Rebecca loved Jacob. What does it mean? How does it apply in our life today? Jacob then deceived the father and had to run for his life. And the mother said, go to your uncle Laban. So this is the first part where I um, like to share. If you, if you think through, Rebecca was uh, actually barren for 20 years. Her mother-in-law, Sarah, was barren for 25 years before Isaac was born. And what will happen to the daughter-in-law in the future? Re um, Rachel. She was barren for 14 years. This is the part I like to share that we hopefully we can see. Sometimes in our life, there are things that happen that we don't know what it was, but actually it's passed down from the previous, previous generations. You know, in our life, we do not have to pay for the sin for, of our forefathers, but the influence of that sins get passed down. And God has a way, has made a way that can be canceled. So that's the, the first part of his journey. Then uh, on his, um, his um, run from home to his uncle uh, Laban in Haran, he was sleeping one day, God appeared to him, and God showed him that how can you overcome all this? God opened heaven to him, and he saw angels asc ascending and descending. And also, when you're on the run, when you have no home to go to, no one to talk to, no money and no future, what do you do? And he went to God with it, and God showed him how do you overcome that. That would be the second part of his journey. And having come to know God, having come to hear God, having been trained by God and being purified, going through fires, and there was a fear still inside him. What he learned to do is when you have got an issue, when you've got fear in your heart, all you need to do is go to God if you know you have a God who is alive. And he learned to do that, and he struggled with God. And that was the time when he said, God, unless you bless me, nothing else matters. And we're going to end with, with Jacob meeting the person who swore that they were going to kill him. And instead of getting killed, he got an embrace from his brother. So that's the journey uh, of, of Jacob. I'd like to go through it with, with a bit, and I'll be jumping it up down and hopefully help us see how does it apply to us today. Because it's no point having a God, a God who is supposed to be a good God, but then you've got problems that you can't solve. And that's what I believe the good news is all about. So we're going to start with uh, Genesis 25, verse 23, when Rebecca was pregnant and he didn't know what was going on. And God told him, there are two nations inside you. You're going to have twins. And God told her in verse 23 of Genesis 25 that the elder will serve the younger. It's very interesting when you read the book uh, of Genesis, right? This is in the very beginning. People seem to hear God all the time. But the time, by, by our time, hearing God seems to be a foreign thing. But Jesus said, my sheep hears my voice. We need to return to our original design. From Genesis 2 onwards, man was hearing God until Adam decided to disobey God. And we were all born separated from God. But even then, people were hearing God's voice. So that's the first thing we must understand. Rebecca actually heard God. 
But um, sometimes the problem is we may hear God, but do we believe God? Do we do that? Do you remember um, uh, Rebecca's mother-in-law right, had problems? He was barren for 25 years. But God told Abraham that I am going to give you an offspring. I'm going to give you a son, and your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky, as many as you can count if you even try. And both of them believe God. But after 10 years of being barren, what did Sarah do? He made a suggestion to the husband. God said it, so it is true. But I am barren. I tell you what, I've got so many. We have so many servants. Why don't you take one of them and sleep with her? And we'll help God to bring forth this promise. And you know what? The husband never complained. The husband said, okay, let's go. And there started the problem. And here you got Rebecca. She heard God. The older one will serve the younger one. But one day he heard, as uh, Isaac was getting older, Isaac told the eldest son, Esau, go and get me a um, hunt an animal for me, let's cook, and I have something I need to do before I go. I'm getting old. I'm going to give you a blessing that can only come from the father to the eldest son. And Rebecca heard that. She panicked. God said the older one is going to serve the younger one. So what did she do? She has an idea, a very good idea. She told the younger son to go and pretend to be the older brother and go and get the blessing of the firstborn. And um, so Isaac happened to like, um, it happened to be an action man. And Esau is an action man. He goes hunting and he gets animal. But Jacob is the sensitive one. He is more domesticated. He loves cooking, he loves sewing, he loves to look after the family. And is that a wrong thing to do? And uh, even in Romans 9.13, it says that Jacob, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Why would God hate anyone? What does it even mean? What does Jacob represent that God hates so much? One way of looking at it, Jacob represents the flesh. The flesh comes from, sorry, Esau represents the flesh. But Jacob represents sensitivity to the spirit realm. Spirit realm is a realm that we cannot see. But one thing we must, le we must learn, just because Rebecca loved Jacob and God loved Jacob is not necessarily the same thing. Not everything spiritual is God. Just because you see miracle doesn't mean all miracles are from God because the devils can also bring about miracles. I'd like to share a story a long time ago. I used to have a lot of migraine attacks, very bad ones. And, but I also love God and I, I believe in miracles. And so we were praying that we have, we have a friend who I look up as um, um, somebody more mature spiritually. And uh, she would come and pray for me. And one day I was just under such a bad attack. I was in so much pain. She would come in, clap her hands, pray for me, and the pain moved immediately. And it didn't happen once or twice. It happened several times. I started to look up to this person as somebody who knows God. It's obviously very spiritual because that, ha that things happen so, so tangibly. But as the time goes, it turns out that this person who I thought was very spiritual was hearing God, but also hearing voices from other places. And it was not God. That's why it's very important that as we grow as believer, we need to know the word of God so that when you look to obey God by his voice, you learn to discern which is God's voice, which is the enemy's voice. On some, most of them, it's our own voice. So here we have God. Rebecca loving Jacob, and God say, Jacob, I love. But they are not the same thing because it's the same Rebecca who decided to suggest to his son, go and pretend to be Esau and steal that blessing because God already said that the older one will save the younger one. But that was not of God. That was just no different from Sarah suggesting to Abraham and help God bring about what God has said. So what... 
Jacob is supposed to be. He's supposed to be living life by the Spirit instead of living life by the flesh. How do we live by the Spirit? Galatians 5.16 says, I live by, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Jacob has a potential to be Holy Spirit-led. Jacob may be sensitive to the things, the spiritual things, but not everything spiritual is God. We need to grow and mature and discern what is God and what is not God because not everything spiritual is God. John 6, 16 say, The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The word I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and full of life. When you have become a believer, when you start reading the Bible, when you start to change your life, you start to, to love the Bible. But we must be careful. It's not the Bible that we want to worship. It's a living God that we want to follow. Sometimes by following the Bible to the T, we become religious. Being religious and being spiritual are similar, but it's not the same. It continues on. Because what the flesh wants, what you do based on your performance, because of your talent, because of your ability, or things you do from your soul, which is your intellect, your emotion, your will, you can actually make decisions by sheer desire, by sheer determination. But all you will get is performance of the flesh. It may be good just for a short while, but it's not long-lasting because the desires of the flesh is always contrary to what the Spirit wants. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit, the voice of the living God. Then the, what the, the Spirit desires is always in conflict what the flesh desires. So after... Um, Esau discovered that the brother has stole his blessing. This is what happened in Genesis 21, uh, 27, verse 41. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given away to Jacob. So this is what Esau said. He vowed, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Life and death is in the power of the tongue, our tongue, what we say and what other people say to us. Word curses spoken over you has power in your life, but with a living God that can be canceled. I grew up in Indonesia and I grew up in a middle income family. I never really had problems with money. And I've shared before in the past, I never really had a money problem. But from very young, I've always had this fear. Fear of not having enough money. Fear of running out of money. And as I grew up, as I grew older through high school, even through university, it grew to, I don't think I'll ever die of hunger, but I don't think I deserve a lot of things in life. I don't think I deserve to be successful. And as I graduate, I started working. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought of doing trading. I thought of doing many things. But this thought in the back of mind continue on. I just don't think I deserve to be blessed. I don't think I can succeed in doing that. And if I'm to do trading, I feel guilty if I make profits from someone. I had no idea what that came from. And that went on and on and on. But at the same time, I think I am... Um, very hardworking person. I think I'm a good person and I study hard. I try to find skill that I can use to, to do well. And I did well financially. I've shared before in the past that I end up making a lot of money. I made a lot of money at the age of 20 years old. But by the time I was 21, I lost everything. And what I had greatly feared came upon me. And this is a principle that you can read in the Bible, in the book of Job 3.25. What you greatly fear in your life will come upon you. I didn't know that. But now that I've become a Christian, I read the Bible, I learned about it. So how do I get rid of this fear? Why is this fear even there? Again, sins of our forefathers 
are not sins we need to pay. But its influence, this generational influence, can influence you, both the positive as well as the negative. And um, once, once, you know, as a born-again believer, once you are born again, your spirit is alive and you want to do things that please God. But your soul hasn't changed. Your intellect, your emotion, your will hasn't changed. You want, your soul wants to do things that pleases me, you. We are very self-centered in the soul. So there is this battle between the spirit wanting to please God and the soul wanting to please self. So you have this battle going on. And this is also part of uh, Jacob's journey. And also when, when you do things that disobeys God's principle, there is fear try to come in into you. When you have fear, you become shameful. And then you take control. This is a principle what we call fear, shame, control. It first happened, you can, the first record of this is in, I think it's in Genesis 3 verse 10. God already told Adam, this garden had got many, many beautiful trees. You can eat from all of them except this one tree, tree of knowledge of good and evil. You must not eat from this tree. And what did Adam do? He saw the wife eating it. He just kept quiet. He didn't make any suggestion. But when he saw nothing happen to the wife, she didn't die, she ate it himself. When you disobey God, fear will try to come in. When fear comes in, the enemy will use it to shame you. When you feel shame, you take control. How did Adam do that? God was walking in the garden, as he usually does, speaking to Adam. And God said, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I heard you. But I was afraid, so I hide myself. When God called him because he disobeyed God, he became shameful. He said, I was naked. So he took control by hiding. And this is not of God. When you, when you make a mistake today, being a believer and knowing the blood of Jesus has taken away your sin, you do not have to be in shame anymore. But the devil will do this to sow shame into your life. Shame is an attack on your identity. Shame is saying, if you do bad thing, you're a bad person. If you do good thing, you're a good person. But that is not of God. God tells us the Holy Spirit come to convict us of guilt. When you do a wrong thing, when you disobey God, you will feel guilty. And that is of God. So that because you know the blood of Jesus has taken away your sin, you don't have to be afraid to come back to God and say, God, I need help. So the next time you ever, if you have any kind of fear in your heart that caused you to be shameful, you need to know that is not from God. That is from the pit of hell. So Jacob was running around and he made a mistake and he, he, he cheated. Basically, he deceived his father, cheated his brother, because he obeyed the mother, okay? So he had to run. In Genesis 28, verse 15, this is what happened. Are we there yet? I'm sorry, I just, I just skipped there. On the way to Haran, while he was fleeing uh, Canaan land, to go to where the uncle Laban is living, the mother's brother. Jacob was resting one night and God appeared to him in a dream. He saw a stairway leaning on the earth, uh, resting in heaven. And this is what Genesis 28, 12 says. He, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on earth with its top reaching heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending. What does it mean? How does it apply to our life today? Let's take a look at verse 15. Verse 15 said, God said, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. This is God appearing to Jacob. And he said, I will bring you back to this land, this Canaan land that you are running away from. I will not leave you until I have done all that I have promised you. Are there any promises you think God has given to us today? All you need to do is go to Deuteronomy 28, verse 3 to verse 14.
God said you'll be blessed coming in, blessed going out, you'll be blessed in the country, blessed in the city. These are all promises from God. And God reminded Jacob that I am with you. This is why I... Nowadays when I read the Bible, I like to spot the gospel because to me the gospel is knowing that God is alive and he is with you. And this is Jacob's gospel moment. Now let's go back to... Um, verse 12 in Genesis 28. In a dream, there were a stairway and angels were ascending and descending. If God is with you and is alive, all you need to do is go to Him. Whatever challenges you're facing in your life, all you need to do is to go to God. God, I've got this problem. God, I need help. And all you need to do is speak to God. How do we speak to God? I shared uh, just last month. How do we speak to God? When you speak in tongue, you are speaking to God. When you're speaking in tongue, God is speaking to you. This is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, and Isaiah 28, verse 11. And you can take time and meditate on that. So when you're speaking, to, when you're speaking in tongue, you're speaking to God. When you're speaking in tongue, God is speaking to you, except your mind is not fruitful. And if you go to 1 Corinthians 14, Paul also tells us that you can actually ask God for interpretation of your tongue, and it will come to you. So God is preparing Jacob. As you go through this training, this refining, God is telling him that I am with you. Come to me anytime, because everything you need is with me. So on the way, he is running over to Laban. And he arrived in Haran, and by the well, he saw a beautiful girl who happens to be his cousin, Rachel. And uh, after introducing each other, then Rachel find out he's the cousin, so Rachel brought him home. He met Uncle Laban. And, and after exchanging pleasantries, catching up because they met for the first time, Jacob never, there's no record of him telling his uncle, that I actually deceived my father, robbed my, my, my brother, and, 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 just fought, and it was my mother's fault that everything happened. Now I've got nowhere to go, i got no home, I'm all alone, and I've got no money. So Uncle Laban said, oh no, wow, you're here, so you should stay at least a month. But I'm, and just work for me and I will give you some wages. There is no negotiation because he's got nowhere to go anyway. He's got nobody to talk to and got no money. So he said, okay. Then he fell in love with his cousin, Rachel. Then he went to Uncle Laban. I want to marry Rachel. Uncle Laban said, no problem. It's going to cost you seven years of working for me. For someone who's got no home to go to, no money, no future, he didn't negotiate the cost. He said, okay, seven years, no problem. But he didn't know a deceiver did not know he was about to meet a master deceiver, <laughs> Uncle Laban. And this is actually what happened. This is um, uh, what Jacob went through. Jacob said, this is my situation. You know, you cheated me for 20 years. I worked seven years for my two wives, and I even uh, worked six years for my wages. What happened here? Jacob learned that God is alive, and God is with him. And that's what we have today. That is called the gospel. He must have processed to God. God, what to do? I have got this money issue. You know, I've worked all these things. Now I've got wives, I've got kids, but okay, I've got food. If I need milk, I go to the barn, I squeeze some milk, I'm, I, can, I have food, but I have no money. What about my future? I'm, I have no independence. I'm going to be dependent on Uncle Laban for the rest of my life. God is a living God. God is a very present help in time of need. God gave him some ideas. This is what God told him in a dream, in a dream. It's interesting. People dream a lot in, in, in those days. God is a living God. He speaks to us. My sheep hears my voice. How does God speak to you? What is the language that you are familiar with God on? God can speak to us through dreams, through visions, through thoughts, through scriptures, through fellow believers. But this is how God got across to Jacob. One day in a dream, he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating. The flock are streaked, speckled, spotted. For I have seen 
all that Laban has been doing to you. So one day, after many years working for Laban and getting his wages changes many times, he got really fed up and they had an argument. And Laban said, okay, okay, I have seen how good, how your God has blessed you. I have prospered because of your God. Just tell me how you want me to be paid. And because he's been spending time speaking to God and God has showed him what to do. And he has listened to God. He said, okay, I tell you what. Separate all your flock, all the strict, speckled, and spotted, the ugly ones, and separate the beautiful ones, all the white ones, all the black ones. I will take care of all the white and black ones, and the offspring of those, if they are strict, speckled, speckled or spotted, they are my wages. But so Laban said, that's it, I've got a free lunch, because all the single colored one will only give pure breed. And biologically, I think that is proven. So he thought he had a, a free lunch. But Jacob actually heard from God. He has learned what is the gospel. God is a living God. And God can speak to him. And he can go to God for whatever problem he has. And God spoke. And he listened. And he went and negotiated with Uncle Laban. And Laban said, okay, it would be free lunch. And you see, the thing is, it's good to be able to hear God's voice. But it's of no good if you do not obey him. What Jacob did, whatever he heard, he put it into action. Here we see that he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they would be directly in front of the flock when they came to drink, as they mated in front of the branches. Even those all white, all black, they will end up giving offspring that are streaked, speckled, and spotted. Now, you can read the details in Genesis 30, verse 38, 39, and thereabout. But what is the principle here? God is saying, whatever you are conscious of, you reproduce. So when you have an issue, you bring it to God. Don't just spend a, a minute or two and run away. Spend time, meditate on the word of God until the logos become rema to you. Meditate, meditate, because whatever you're conscious of, you will reproduce. So Jacob learned that God is a living God and you can go to God whenever you have problems. He had a lot of problems. He was there for many years, for 20 years. And he learned to listen to God and he learned to obey God. What happened to him? What happened? What is the potential to you if you learn to hear God and obey God? Genesis 30 verse 43 says, In this way, the man, Jacob, grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks, female and male servants, camels and donkeys. This is our potential. God is a good God. God is a very present help in time of need in all areas of our life. Not only for health, not only for family, but also your finances. Not only for your work, not only for your ministry, but in all areas of your life. You know, we, we have this Bible study every Tuesday night in our life group. And uh, recently we were studying on uh, the book of Psalm sometime last year. And you know, in the book of Psalm, God very often praise this guy, King David. David, a man after my own heart. And we have one brother who always get very irritated that God always praises this David because for him, David is an adulterer. David is, <laughs> is a murderer. But why God keep praising him? And then somebody in the, in, the, in the Bible group, in the Zoom said, you know, David, did you know that David never, never, ever lost a single battle? Just read through the, your Bible. And David never ever lost a single battle. Why? Because David always inquired of the Lord in the area of war. But you never have a record of David going to God and asking about women, <laughs> about family. In this way, 
the man become exceedingly prosperous. Why? Because when he had money issue, he went to God about money. He's not a super spiritual man. He doesn't only go to God about family, about ministry, but he goes to God about money as well. Talk to God. Having been through all this journey, having learned a lot about the, from the living God, about the living God, and having practiced it, but the fear, the fear that he had from the word spoken over him, word curses has power over your life. And, um, and he was afraid. But what Jacob had learned by now, when you got a problem, when you feel unrest in your heart, talk to God, talk to God. Don't underestimate how God can speak to you at your level. I remember, you know, just this past week, we have this issue with Silicon Valley Bank. How many of you heard that? You know, my job happened to involve uh, investment in the banking area, so I'm also troubled. But I read just last week that Silicon Valley Bank is the second largest bank failures in the last 15 years. And I've shared in the past, there's one day I was just praying, and because my job investing is investing in bonds and things like that, I was praying one morning, and I invested in, I invest in a lot of bonds, but I invested in this specific bank bond. But that morning I was praying, and I thought about that bank bond, and I have an unrest in my heart. So that afternoon I went to work, and I called my bank, and I said, what is happening to this bond? He said, oh, it's doing very well. Everybody's looking for it because it's a classic single A rated bank with 6% yield and five-year five year maturity. Perfect, perfect, perfect for private clients. So I invested and then it was going up, but I had this unrest that morning. So I sold it. And then a year later, Lehman Brothers happened. The whole banking world was in chaos. There was a global financial crisis. And then I remember that day, almost a year ago. So I go and check what happened to that bank. That bank collapsed. The bond that I invested would have become zero. It became zero. And only last week, because of Silicon Valley Bank, the largest bank that collapsed before the SVB Bank was Washington Mutual Bank. And that was the bond I owned 15 years ago. Do not underestimate how God can speak to you. When God speaks to you, when He arrests you, pause. Psalm 46 says, God is a very present help in time of need. And Psalm 46 10 says, be still. Don't be in a rush. When God talks to you, be still. When, God, when you go to God and ask God about something and you hear Him tell you what to do, do not rush. Ask Him how to do it. So this is what Jacob is going through now. Having been through all he did, he's gone through. He still have this fear. He still have this fear. He said to God, God, save me. Because by, day, by this time, by Genesis 32, God appeared again to Jacob. Jacob, it's time to go home. Go back. I promise you, I will take you back home. Now it's time to go home. But he realized to go home. Now he's got two wives and got 11 kids and got a lot of servants with a lot of kids and a lot of, and a big banking account. It's got a lot of, you know, donkeys, cows, and, um, and, and all that. And to go back, he has to go through an area where it's controlled by a guy named Esau, his brother. He said, Lord, save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. I am, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. You know, sometimes when you're alone, you're poor, you've got no home to go to, and you've got everybody else to blame. If I die, I die, you don't care. But when you become rich, when you've got wife, kids, and a big bank account, you start to be afraid of dying. And this is where Jacob was. But remember, Galatians 5.1 said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Jesus died to take away your sin so that you know you have a living God with you. But unless your heart is healed, you are never free to actually follow God. God did not just want your sin to be forgiven. God also wants to take away the penalty of that sin. That penalty is separation from God. The healing of the heart. 
Incidentally, we do have a ministry in this church called Heart Restoration Ministry, and we will go. We, we go into a lot more details on how the sins of the forefathers affect us today, how the soul and spirit battle in our life, and how sometimes ungodly belief can affect us. So this is something you can avail yourself. And uh, sometimes we do need a certain number of people we, before we conduct a class. But if you're interested, write an email to Chai Fen or, or Alan or Church of It and say, I want to know more about HRM, Heart Restoration Ministry, and we'll create a class for you. So now he's supposed to go back, and he's fearful. And he prepared. He said, okay, I have to go back. I'm going to obey God. God said it. I've got to obey. But to be safe, now he's, got his, he's, he's gotten very rich. So he prepared in such a way that he's going to prepare a lot of gifts for brother Esau. And he's going to put them in front with a very long entourage. Then he's going, and then he's going to go and meet Esau. But he's going to put his servants and the children behind him. And behind that, his wife Leah, second best wife, right? And the children. And at the very back end, it will be Rachel and Joseph. And he's going to go and meet Esau. But before that, he was left alone, and an angel appeared to him and wrestled with him all night. But he would not let go until that angel said, let go. Daybreak has come. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This is Jacob's second gospel moment when he realized, unless I have a living God, nothing will, 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 nothing matters. But now he said, unless I have your blessing, nothing matters. Because the only thing matters is I have a living God who has all the solution I need. And God, and he didn't know that angel was actually God. And this is what it says in Genesis 32 verse 26. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Then God said, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob. Jacob means deceiver. Jacob means grabber. Jacob means conniver. Actually, he's talking about all of us. I grew up, think I have very, very low self-esteem. I have a lot of insecurity. I didn't know why I always think of myself not ever deserving of anything good. I didn't know where it came from until I learned about healing of the heart. And I found out it was actually, and this is a very long journey, and through the revelation from the Holy Spirit, and then I went to my parent and asked, actually many, many years ago, during the, um, the Dutch time in Indonesia, my, un my grandfather was a banker. And he was a manager, and he has certain authority, and he has a friend who wanted to go into business. And the, fa the friend couldn't get a loan, but if his friend, the bank manager, would give a personal guarantee, the bank would lend him. And my grandfather actually did. And the friend actually failed in his business, and my grandfather could not make good that loan. And he had to flee the country. Now, that was a story that nobody... I heard about it, I didn't know the details. But after it was revealed to me through inner healing ministry and all that, I go and run and ask my uncle, my father, and all that, and it turned out that is actually what happened. But that fear, what I saw, that fear that I experienced was in my father, in my uncles, and everybody all around, in my cousins. And I didn't know that's what the root was. But there's a scripture in the Bible. It's in Gal Galatians 3.13. It says, Christ has redeemed us, past tense, from the curse of the law. I used to, th to think that because I'm a Christian, curses do not have a right over me anymore because Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law by dying on the tree. But now I come to realize that is not the message. The price has been paid, but I must know how to appro appropriate it. So Galatians 3.13 is actually is a sword. Once you know there is an ungodly covenant that has been entered, that affects you, as revealed by the Holy Spirit, you can actually cancel it with Galatians 3.13. And that's what I did. And you know what? Today, it doesn't have a... It does, it, it's just like water off a duck's back. 
It doesn't have a hold over me anymore. But that's only one area. There are many, many areas that the devil has entered into our life and we didn't even know about it. So when, when Jacob actually understood and said that I will not let you go unless you bless me because Jacob knew this is what I need. Without God, nothing else matters. So when God asked him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. God said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with human and have overcome. Why Israel? What is the meaning of Israel? Israel means one who struggled with God. Israel is, it also means prince, but Israel also means one who reigns with God. When you know you have a living God who is ever-present, all you need to do is ask Him, go to Him, and He has the answer you need, you start to become Israel yourself. So, so you would have thought everything was fine and everything is a hallelujah moment. And this is what happened. Genesis 33, verse 1. Jacob looked up and there was Esau. Not only Esau was there, he, came, he was coming with 400 of his warriors. You thought you have trusted God, you have run to God, you heard God, you obeyed God, you've been tested by God, you passed a lot of tests, you thought everything is fine. If Jacob had not gotten the revelation, I will not let you go unless you bless me, he could have made a U-turn or he could have delayed for another time to obey God. But it is time to face the music. Very often you will find trusting God doesn't mean you get to avoid difficult times. Trusting God means that you need to obey God. But God said, He promised you that I'm going to be with you, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to take you back and fulfill all that I have promised for you. Shema. Shema means hearing and obeying God. Shema pleases God. So Jacob really didn't know what to expect. Esau could still be revengeful. Esau could still kill him. But he has presented a lot of presents. And he's prepared. He went down and he bowed down to his brother seven times. And he prepared his servants and his family, the uh, Leah and the, and the children and Rachel. But instead, Esau came and embraced his brother and they wept. What a beautiful ending. Whatever you fear you have, if you don't have healing in your heart, you'll be running away from that fear the rest of your life. God wants to heal our heart so that no fear has any space in our, in our heart. Proverbs 16, 7 says this, When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way. He causes even their enemies to make peace with them. What does it mean to us today? What is the gospel? I've shared several times. The gospel came in Genesis 2 verse 2. After God finished all his work, he put Adam in the garden. Basically, Adam knew God was with him. He can go to God, he can ask God, Adam has to name all the animals in the garden. That's a tough job. But he's got God with him. That's the gospel. Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again. He died for our sins so that God can be with us. He was buried to pay, to pay for our sins. But he raised again and he's living inside us. God is with us and God is in us today. But there is a requirement. Number one, you need to be born again first, according to John 3, verse 3. Why? Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. How do you get born again? A, B, C. Number one, you've got to acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God. That's it. B, you've got to believe He died on the cross and His blood paid for your sin so that God is with you. And C, you just need to confess Him as your Savior and invite him into your heart. 
then your spiritual eyes will be open. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can do that anytime. Now, once you're born again, you need to be born of water and spirit. And this is when the journey became, uh, be, the journey starts. Being born again is not your destination. Being safe and go to heaven when you die is not your destination. It's the beginning of a destination. What is the real destination? It's actually enjoying heaven on the way to heaven while you're on earth. You must be born of water and spirit. God is with us. All we need to do is go to God and ask him what to do, and then do what he tells us to do. Oops, can we? All right, can I have the next slides, please? What is the potential? What's the benefit of the gospel? I just have a few slides left. John 16, 23, it says, In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. If you understand the gospel correctly, you can have whatever you ask. Why? When? What is that day? The day Jesus died for our sin so that God can be with men again like he was with Adam in the garden. This is a done deal. You have God with you. Do you know how to appropriate it? You have a big bank account with you. Do you know how to draw money out of it? John 15, verse 7. Oops. If you abide in me, take permanent residence, put your trust in me as your living God, and my word abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it, will, it shall be, be done unto you. This is another whatever you ask for. But what is the requirement? You got to put your trust in God. And number two, his words need to abide in you. Now, this is the part you need to trace back the root word for my word, this is not logos. This is rhema. When his voice, his spoken word abide in you, you can have what you want. And the result is in verse 8, that it is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, proving you are my disciple. Understanding the gospel correctly is the best discipleship program. You need the presence of God and you need the voice of God. John 15, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that lasts, so that, there you go, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. You have the potential of getting whatever you ask for in Jesus' name, but it's not an entitlement. You need to learn how to draw the benefit, but it is already yours, it's been given. You got to... You got to learn to apply the gospel. God is our refuge and, very, and, and strength, an ever-present help in time of need. He's with you. If you have need, you got to go to Him. Don't run away from Him. Be still. Don't run around and know that I am God because the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The journey of Jacob Give us a glimpse what has become available to us today and still available to us today. I will not let you go. It's the revelation that Jacob got. Is this yours today? Can you tell God, God, I will not let you go unless you bless me because nothing else matters. I need you. If you are one who do believe that God is with you and that Christ is alive and living in you, but you do not know how to hear his voice. There's no difference between you and the rest of the world that don't know God. We need to spend time and invest resources to learn to discern God's voice from the enemy's voice, from our own voice. If you can hear God, if you believe God is alive and with you, and you know how to discern his voice, but you don't dare to obey him, you are no different from the rest of the people of the earth either. However, if you're willing to listen to him and obey him, this is the promise in Isaiah 119. You will eat the best of the land. That's the struggle of Jacob. I have a, um, a homework 
for all of us in the coming week. Spot the gospel. I thank God for Dave. Thank you for your testimony today. It was, it's a wonderful testimony. Very often when you hear a testimony, you hear Dave's story today. I don't qualify, but hallelujah, I have a ministry uh, job. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is when Dave heard from God. My way is the higher way. That is not only a word in the Bible. That's not a logos. Not, but it became a rema to him. That's the gospel moment. Now, what I want to challenge us today, don't wait too long. In the coming week, if you are in the habit of journaling, you have a lot of testimonies. If not, you think back, all of us have experienced God before. Take out your testimony and spot the gospel. Recall the gospel. I've shared before that several years ago, I was going through a very difficult time. I needed to make some decision. It was very difficult. I ended up having an uh, autoimmune issue, and I got started to have a patch in my hair, right, a bald patch. I went to the doctor. The doctor said, oh, this is called alopecia errata, but yours is very mild. With a bit of uh, medication or, or a steroid job, it'll be okay. So I said, steroid job. So I had steroid jabs. And it didn't get better. From one spot, it became two. I went back to the doctor and said, well, it's still okay. It should be gone in no time. Give it a bit of time. It became three bald patches. I went to the doctor again and said, you know, the doctor said, this thing is very peculiar. Sometimes you can predict because it's stress-related. When she said it's stress-related, I heard it is fear. Because stress is just a common way of saying fear. There is no fear in God. I understood that. I started, I went for my inner healing ministry. I went for, I take out all my testimony. I went and believed God. And soon enough, it was gone. Now, when I share a testimony like that, even in the past, I said, I had problem, and I believe God, and I'm healed. But today, I want to spot the gospel. The day when the doctor told me it is stress-related, I understood it. I heard the voice of God. He says, that is fear. Don't manage fear. Fear got to be kicked out because there's no fear in love. So can we do that in the coming week? Challenge yourself. Take out your testimonies and spot the gospel. Why? Why is this important? Because whatever you are conscious of, you will reproduce. And you can reproduce in your, in your life. What are your issues? Is it money issues? Is it job issues? Is it clients issues? Is it uh, health issues? Go to God. Hear God. And obey God. Go back to your past, to your journey, to your testimony. Spot the gospel. Recall the gospel so that whatever you're conscious of, you will reproduce. May we become people of distinction. Let us pray. Father, I just want to thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the gospel. Lord, help us, teach us how to appreciate the gospel. You, the living God, with us. Help us, Lord, to run to you. Help us, Lord, to hear you and obey you so that your goodness may be displayed through our lives, that the people around us would want to know who is that living God. Thank you, Father. And we pray, believing we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.